For over 1,300 years, the Islamic world was never left headless. From the revelation of the Prophet peace be upon him during the early 7th century to the decline of the late Ottomans in the 20th century, Muslim history was always, for the most part, triumphant and glorious. In fact, the Islamic world is at one point the role model of the world for an incredible amount of time. Muslims enjoyed their golden ages in a time when the rest of the world was in its dark ages. However, in the year 1922, for the first time ever, the Islamic world was left headless. The new world order began and the united Islamic world was divided in a way to spare it from the past. The long powerful Islamic world was shattered to pieces. Hence, we now live in a world of extreme isolation, nationalism, and tyranny. However, how did it all begin? How did the Islamic world fall? What is the new order and how did it begin? During the medieval period, the Catholic Church's corruption had reached an all-time high. Not only was the church corrupt, but it also prevented scientific advancement and brought modifications to the religion. The church banned literacy to suppress people's opinions on God having a son. This led to a dark age. Meanwhile, the Islamic world was prospering more than ever. The new religion of Islam was spreading knowledge all around the world. The Ghaznavids began sponsoring madrasas, and the Fatimids started the world-renowned Al-Azhar University, which remains to this very day. Nizam al-Mulk, the famous Sajjuk vizier, made institutional reforms and for the first time in the history of mankind, all subjects and specialties were combined into a single university curriculum. This university would be called the Nizamiya Institute. It began the rise of colleges in the world. Europeans would learn Arabic and go to al andalus and other Muslim countries to study medicine and other sciences. For a millennium, Muslims led the world in every field. The dark age that Europe had long been in led to the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, and the great problem that emerged, modernism. The god of the Enlightenment became the human mind itself. The idea was that the human mind would tell us what was wrong and right. They overturned the church and replaced it with the human mind. From then on, the churches and the states would be separate, and the age of secularism would begin in Europe. They would use their minds to develop science and technology, which was great, however, the idea that every day would be better than the last and that with every passing day they would get closer to achieving perfection and eventually they'd end up in a utopia one day. This was the main idea of modernists. Modernists also believed that everything in life was meaningless, but there were only things that held meaning to people. Thus, Europeans became staunch followers of nihilism, the idea of rejecting morals, religions, cultures, and traditions. This was the age of modernism. It would soon globalize and create a new world order. The biggest enemy of modernism was traditionalism, the idea of sticking to certain beliefs and doctrines. The Islamic world found its golden ages by adhering to traditionalism. Now, it would see its downfall when clashed with modernism. The Islamic belief is that mankind had already reached its pinnacle during the Prophet peace be upon him's time. They were the most perfect society and from then on mankind could only go downwards. It says that so long ago the world was at its darkest point and now we're going to our darkest point, thus the great opposition to modernism. After the Second Great World War, modernists began to worry. The idea that the world would soon reach a utopia and that with every day they were progressing was being doubted. After all the horrible atrocities and bloodshed, a new age started, postmodernism. Postmodernists believed in the irrationality of things. To doubt even the most basic concepts and that nothing was 100% sure, they would still follow the concepts of modernism except unlike the latter, there was no clear-cut path between their vision of right and wrong. Back we go to the Islamic world. Around the age of modernism, the Islamic world began its steady decline for several reasons such as internal fighting, the decadence of morals and values, nationalism, and the effect of western influences. Around the 19th century, the British were preparing for the Ottoman Empire's doom. The latter was the last protector of the Islamic world, and so its fall meant the fall of the Islamic world. Muslims at the time did not understand that the late Ottomans would be the last caliphs. After the fall of Vienna in 1683, the Ottoman Empire slowly began to decline due to a number of internal and external problems. Colonization and the new trade routes discovered by the Europeans caused the Ottoman Empire to seriously start lacking in terms of its economy. Previously, Europe's trade route to Asia had been the Mediterranean Sea, which was in control of the Ottomans. Though, when the west coast of Africa was discovered and then colonized by the Europeans, 
the Mediterranean Sea lost its importance as they no longer needed to pay taxes to the Ottomans. Most of the high elites of the Ottoman palace became comfortable and started enjoying themselves rather than focusing on the situation of their people. Disloyalty and even betrayal by statesmen were common. As instability in the Islamic world increased, Europe's dominance over the world went on the rise. As modernization and westernization globalized, Muslims from all around the world began doubting their ways and thinking that if Europe was successful, they too could find that same success if they followed in their footsteps. But what they didn't know was that traditionalism was that which would keep them strong and that after trying to adopt modernism, they would only go downhill. Moreover, modernity would break apart the Ottoman Empire, with one of its greatest products being nationalism. Nationalism would infect the Ottoman Empire like how untreated gangrene kills a wounded soldier. The notion of having a single nation, a brotherhood, would be destroyed. Over the past centuries, people from all around the empire would previously call themselves Ottoman, whether they were Christians, Muslims, Jews, and etc. The empire was very unified for the most part and ran through the system of millet, in which confessional communities would abide by their own laws with little interference from the Ottoman state. This system, which was based on Islamic principles, pleased people from all faiths and beliefs. However, after the French Revolution in the late 18th century, the rise of nationalism extended from Europe to the Ottoman Empire during the 19th century. Each millet became increasingly independent with the establishment of its own schools, hospitals, churches, and other facilities. These activists gave too much autonomy to the Christian population in the empire and spectated them from the framework of the government. Different ethnic and religious groups began a new form of identification and started dreaming of building their own nation states like Europe had. With all of Europe already allied against the Ottoman Empire, the splitting of the Ottoman Empire and then the Islamic world was inevitable. While nationalistic revolutions would occur in the Balkans with the help of Russia, the same would happen in the Middle East and Turkey itself with the support of Britain. Since the Islamic world and the empire had both become weak, both Muslim and non-Muslim nations assumed that if they broke off from the Ottoman Empire and made their own small states, while following in the footsteps of Europe, they could be successful. During the mid-19th century, the Tanzimat reforms, which secularized Ottoman leadership and created a constitution, occurred. The purpose of these reforms was to make Ottoman law acceptable to Europeans so that capitulations could be removed and sovereigns recovered and to modernize the Islamic traditional law. The Ottoman Sultans began to try to make the Ottoman Empire itself a European nation. They left the idea of traditionalism that brought them to their golden ages and officially began slowly adopting modernism, which could have led to the empire's doom early on had it not been for a genius prince, Sultan Abdul Hamid II. When Sultan Abdul Hamid first inherited the throne, he declared a constitutional monarchy administration. However, it didn't take long for him to realize that the administration was leading the state to disintegration. Young officers and intellectuals who found support from the public and admired Europe moved away from the realities of their homeland and remained alien to the history of the state and the tradition that kept the state alive. The cost of their enthusiasm would be severe for the whole world. After removing the failing system of constitutional monarchy, the Sultan began reviving the weakened Muslim empire. He abandoned the idea of westernization that his predecessors had introduced to the state and instead adhered to traditionalism and pan-Islamism. The idea that all Muslims worldwide should unite under one caliphate. He was successful in counteracting the growing European powers surrounding him, undoing the secularization that occurred during the Tanzimat period, and gaining the undivided loyalty of the vast majority of Muslims from all around the world. Abdul Hamid II played the role of an actual caliph, as much as he did a sultan, unlike his predecessors. He brought an era of unity, centralization, and pan-Islamism at a time when Western imperialism was at its peak. He protected and took care of Muslims in the lands of Russia, France and Britain. The Sultan somewhat reversed the impact of westernization in the Islamic world and brought back one last hope. He was the last salvation. Although Sultan Abdul Hamid was opposed to westernization, it is not to say that he was against it in every aspect. He modernized the country in terms of its military, transportation, education, bureaucracy, and infrastructure. He was utterly loved by the vast majority of his subjects. However, after a rebellion conspired by German and British Freemasons, a fatwa full of lies and slanders was written and accepted by the fatwa officer of the state. 
The year was 1908, and Sultan Abdul Hamid had been dethroned after a prosperous 33 year long reign. Thus, the downfall of the empire became inevitable, as the state would be left in the hands of incompetents who would work for the demands of the West. Sultan Abdul Hamid would be the last true caliph and sultan of the empire, as after him the empire would be run by de facto rule, and the sultans or caliphs would only act as head figures. Nationalists around the empire found the perfect chance to rebel, and the Ottoman Empire, at its weakest point in history, lost a vast amount of land in a very short amount of time. At first, the Italians would occupy Libya in 1911. Then, the empire would lose 1,200,000 square kilometers of territory in Africa and 250,000 square kilometers of land in Romelia. In 1912, the Balkan War began, after which the Ottoman Empire lost almost all of its European territory. Then, in 1914, Enver Pasha secretly signed a treaty with Germany, which meant the involvement of the Ottoman Empire in the Great World War, which is today known as World War I. Enver Pasha had signed this treaty on behalf of the Ottoman Empire without the Sultan's notice. However, Mehmet Rashad, the Ottoman Sultan, had no choice but to approve of the decision, as it was already finalized, and he knew well that he had no effective power in his hands. Not to mention, invalidating the agreement would be devastating to the reputation of the Ottoman state. The already extremely weakened Ottoman state, just on the verge of destruction, would have the most to lose from World War I. The Young Turks, who had replaced the idea of Ottomanism and the system of millet rule with Turkish nationalism and centralization, had given Arab opportunists the perfect chance to start a full-scale revolt. With the help of the British, the Ottoman Empire lost all its Arab provinces. Not only that, but a large area of Asia Minor would be given to a newly created Armenian state that would have access to the sea. The Ottomans would lose a great amount of territory to Greece as well. The Straits would be internationalized. The strict European control of the Ottoman finance would be established. The Ottoman state was no longer an empire, but a tiny little state that had lost everything. In 1922, the government of the Grand National Assembly, which was based in Ankara, with the command of Mustafa Kemal, a talented Turkish general, voted to overturn the Ottoman government. And so they did, and the caliphate, for the first time in the history of Islam, would be abolished. The Islamic world was left in desperate ruins. Back in 1915, Britain needed the help of Arabs to fight against the Ottomans in the World War. In a series of letters known as the McMahon Hussein Correspondence, the Arabs were promised their own sovereign state if they rebelled against Britain. However, at the very same time, Britain made promises with France and Russia to share the fragmented Ottoman Empire between themselves. This would be known as the sykes picot Agreement. At the same time, the Balfour Declaration was taking place, promising Jews their own ethnic state within the borders of Palestine. It was too obvious that the British were going to keep their promises to the Arabs. However, Arab leaders were so ridiculously bizarre that with all this in consideration, they still took their chances and in the end, their hopes were utterly crushed. Instead, British and French flags would fly high in their homelands for years to come. Jewish Zionists would enter Palestine in large numbers, with Britain aware of what its future consequences would be. At this point in history, just about the entire Muslim world would be under the influence of Western colonialism or imperialism. Britain's greatest weapon against the Islamic world was division. All throughout the world, Muslim countries would be divided into tiny little states. Nationalism would become the most popular and accepted ideology, not only in the Middle East but all throughout the Islamic world. Kurdistan, the homeland of the Kurds, would be shared by Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Armenia, and Syria. Kurds never regained their autonomy back and lost their language, culture, and freedom. The Duren Line, which divided Afghans and even tribes and families between borders, would cause serious problems between Afghanistan and the state that Britain would help establish, Pakistan. Britain would not make fixed borders for Pakistan and India on purpose. Their purpose was to let Indians fight against people of their own race for centuries to come, and they ultimately succeeded in doing so. We must now take a look at the story of Mustafa Kemal, the man who further escalated the problem the British caused, the man who is today known as Ataturk, the father of the Turks.
After succeeding in founding his Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal brought intense changes to Turkey. One thing that Ataturk was known for was shifting the former Ottoman Empire into a very strict, secular and extremely nationalistic nation from which the Islamic morals would be completely banished. He passed a number of laws to end religious domination in Turkey. As soon as Ataturk had created this new secular state, he immediately started abolishing Islamic customs, enforcing western practices upon his people and taking away the country's sense of freedom and heritage. For example, he abolished the wearing of a hijab, a Muslim woman's headscarf, in public institutions, and he even forbade the wearing of the men's traditional Turkish hat, the face to which they had been accustomed to wearing for almost a century. Also, he opened mixed schools for both boys and girls. He even made it illegal for the Adhans in Paris to be recited in Arabic. These new changes and reforms would be called Kemalism. In the end, Ataturk's main goal was to westernize Turkey and secularize all its practices. But aside from that, his aim was to Turkify the country and to destroy everything that didn't represent Turkification. Thus, minorities, in particular Kurds, were prohibited from being who they were. Ataturk neither recognized the Kurdish ethnicity nor the language. Ataturk claimed them to be mountain Turks. Kurds would be disproportionately jailed, imprisoned, and even massacred. This came as a serious surprise, as Kurds had been Ataturk's most loyal followers throughout his fight to establish his state, and in the end, they were horrifically backstabbed. For centuries, Kurds were prevented from learning their own language and following their own culture. The only language recognized by the constitution was Turkish. Though Ataturk may have been a brutal dictator, he is deeply loved by Turks today. The reason being, he regained many of their lands and transformed their tiny little weak country into a much larger and stronger Turkish state. His ideology spread amongst other Muslim leaders, in particular Muhammad Ali Jinnah. During World War II, Great Britain was put in a very difficult situation and was close to losing all of British India. However, just as Indians were about to gain their independence, Jinnah, the leader of the All India Muslim League, worked with the British to split India into two sovereign states, and thus, the natural revolution that was supposed to occur was destroyed by a British devised plan to create hostility in the region for years to come. Like Ataturk, Jinnah was a very nationalistic figure. He idolized the latter and built his state on Western principles, such as secularizing the government. Another leader that also followed the footsteps of Ataturk was Aman Nah Khan, the king of Afghanistan. Though he made nice reforms to improve the educational system, infrastructure, and industry, he also tried to force the deeply conservative and religious population to adopt modernism, westernization, secularism, and nationalism. He even forced the tribal chieftains to shave their beards and wear suits in the Loya Jirga, a meaning of elders. He also encouraged state officials to wear European dress and for women to remove their veils. Though, Afghanistan was very much different than the countries we have previously mentioned. Amal Nahan instilled such anger in the Afghans that wide-scale revolts took place, after which he was forced to flee the country to Italy. Now that we have explained the effect of modernism in the Islamic world and how it all happened, the question still remains as to what really went wrong. What should have been done? The reality is that Muslims themselves brought their own doom upon them. They didn't realize that every state should have its own way of modernization. Ataturk and other leaders like him thought that copying every move of the West meant prosperity. What they didn't know was that in reality, it meant the loss of their own identity and the installation of a European identity that made Muslims no different than the European colonizers. The true way for Muslims to develop would have been to modernize in their own way with the sphere of Islam and the traditions of the people. Instead of abolishing religion, traditional clothing, and imposing European ideology, Muslims should have focused on developing in ways that would have actually helped them, such as infrastructure, schools, hospitals, and technological advancements, like how Sultan Abdul Hamid did. History shows how Sultan Abdul Hamid was truly the last protector and effective caliph of the Islamic world. After his dethronement, Muslims realized what they had lost, but it was too late. The Islamic world's order had been eradicated. The world had fully adopted the new world order. The idea of God had been replaced by the human mind. The Islamic world had fallen, and the modern world was on the rise. Muslims were to see their worst days, and the worst of oppression would be witnessed all throughout the world.